we're going to pivot to Rafael Meza, uh, Castor's own. Uh, Dr. Meza is a distinguished scientist at the British Columbia Cancer Research Institute and a distinguished scholar in lung cancer screening and prevention at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Meza's research interests lie at the interface of epidemiology, biostatistics, and biomathematics. He's an expert in lung cancer epidemiology and prevention and tobacco epidemiology and control. The goal of his research program is to characterize the impact of disease prevention and control in interventions, informing stakeholders and policymakers as to the most effective and efficient ways to improve population health. In particular, he is interested in cancer risk assessment and the analysis of cancer epidemiology data using mechanistic models of carcinogenesis. He is also interested in the mathematical modeling of chronic and infectious disease dynamics and its applications in disease prevention public health policy design. Dr. Meza is principal investigator of the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulation Store and coordinating principal investigator of the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network, also known as CISNET, lung working groups. Prior to joining BC Cancer, Dr. Meza was professor of epidemiology and global health at the University of Michigan and co-leader of the Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the Rogel Cancer Center. So without further ado, I flip it over to you, Raphael. Good luck. Thank you, Alex, for the kind introduction, and thank you all for attending our symposium and, and to the speakers uh, in the session and other sessions, which I think are, of course, addressing very important issues. Um, the goal of my presentation today is to sort of connect uh, the, uh, I guess, the background and the and the. Uh, practical epidemiological policy and uh, even biological issues that were described by uh, uh, Dr. Bialante and Dr. Schnellner um, and connected with, okay, so, uh, but this is a modeling symposium, right? So, so how do we go from uh, uh, I guess uh, looking into the complexity of, of flavored tobacco product use and the potential impact of regulations into trying to to assess and project those using uh, uh, I guess reliable uh, computational models. Um, so uh, just as a, a brief summary of the of the wonderful uh, first two presentations is that uh, we know that tobacco flavored products are associated with high rates of youth experimentation and use, uh, that there are higher use rates in some uh, key population subgroups, of course, uh, predominantly youth, women, black Americans, for instance, in the U.S., uh, that mental cigarettes are associated with lower rates of cessation. Uh, that there are high rates of flavor e-cigarette use among youth, and that uh, in response to these challenges, flavor restrictions and bans have been proposed uh, in the U.S. and in other countries, of course, but within the U.S. at both <clears throat> the federal and the state and local level. And so the question is, is what are the observed and expected impacts? And that's where uh, modeling, as, as already highlighted in the first two presentations, um, has a role to play to help us answer these questions. Um, sort of connecting to the fact that FDA has proposed to uh, uh, ban methyl from cigarettes and flavors from cigars, uh, the question then is, so, so what is the role of modeling? So I think it's helpful to reflect back and, and to uh, put the modeling that we're discussing uh, in this symposium in context of, of what the Tobacco Control Act says. And of course, um, as you all know, uh, within the Tobacco Control Act, it explicitly uh, states that uh, uh, regulations have to be appropriate or being shown to be appropriate for the protection of public health, <clears throat> understood broadly. So the act requires the FDA to assess the risk and benefits to of any proposed regulation or existing regulations to the population as a whole, and to consider the increased or decreased likelihood that uh, current users will stop use and those who don't use yet will start use. So this is where um, I think the role of modeling uh, is, is established within tobacco regulations in the US at the federal level were some of the computational simulation uh, behavioral models that we've been talking about and that we'll be talking about in the next uh, couple of sessions uh, can play a role by 
uh, doing estimations of those benefits and harms or the behavior and public health impacts of proposed or current FDA regulations uh, and uh, assess if those would be appropriate for the protection of public health. So it's it's really clear that within the U.S. context, uh, modeling really has a role to play, and it's thus important to then, as as we're doing this concern, um, symposium, ask the question of so how can we develop reliable models? What are the inputs that we need? What are the questions that we should be focusing on? What are the outputs that would be most helpful? So uh, I'll, I'll sort of summarize in a in a slide sort of in a big uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 summary of, of what are the things then that we need to, for instance, uh, develop models can, that can help us to assess the impact of flavor restrictions. Uh, so what are the data and information requirements? So certainly, as uh, uh, the type of information that was presented by the first two speakers is, is essential, right? We need to understand what are the patterns of use of targeted products and potential alternative products as well. Uh, and ideally, those by flavor categories. Uh, for example, the prevalence of menthol and unmenthol cigarette use uh, by year, sex, age, and, and other characteristics. Uh, what are the transitions prior to the enactment of any flavor restriction uh, uh, to and from alternative products? Are there products that seem to be substitute from one another? Are users moving from certain type of products to other type of products that could uh, potentially affect the impact of uh, uh, a given restriction and uh, potentially be the products that we need to consider uh, as we model the impact of those restrictions. So for example, a, a question that can tell is what are the rates of switching between flavor and unflavored cigar use? Or what are transition rates of menthol and unmenthol cigarette use to and from e-cigarette use? And of course we could then say, oh, and what about flavored versus unflavored e-cigarette use? Of course, very important is what is going to be uh, the potential impact of those restrictions on use of the targeted products as well as alternative products. Uh, so this is sort of the big, the big question, right? Are we going? Are we? Are we going to see uh, reductions, of course, in initiation and cessation of, of the targeted product, particularly if they're removed from the market, uh, of alternative products, of the unflavored version, or are we going to see uh, uh, switches to, to other things? Uh, so I think that's that's a critical, uh, of course, piece of, comp uh, of information that is needed to model the impact of flavor restrictions. Uh, what is the policy or the regulation going to do, or what are users going to do once that regulation is put in place. And so, of course, there are other important considerations and, and the things that need to be considered is not only about what other products they might use uh, or if they might quit tobacco use, but also the potential use of uh, uh, illegal products as well. And and it was it was uh, uh, briefly discussed, but there's of course the question that uh, in order to do good modeling, we need to know what are the health effects of tobacco product use, exclusive product use, dual, poly, and also of of flavors on top of unflavored use, because of course that would be important to consider as uh, models are used to project the impact of <clears throat> flavor restrictions. So once you have all that. Uh, you need reliable computational models uh, accounting for all of these uh, uh, issues above and requirements above to make uh, reasonable projections of what the potential impact of uh, flavor restrictions and, of course, any other policies might have. And it's, let's not forget that... Uh, well, many times, and if you read the Tobacco Control Act, of course, it's focused uh, first and foremost on the overall population. Of course, there is also a focus on subpopulations. And so as we start thinking about the information that is needed, it's not only uh, needed uh, in, in general terms for the U.S. population, but really we need detailed information to allow for better modeling, uh, particularly, let's say, in, in the uh, as a first step uh, information by age and sex <laughs> or gender. And then, but of course, since we know some of these products are concentrated in some uh, particular population subgroups, we also might need information at uh, other uh, sociodemographic factor level. 
Uh, so that certainly brings uh, 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 the question and the challenge that we really need a lot of data. So, of course, modelers were very grateful to uh, Dr. Berlanti and others who are producing this information, as well as uh, our own center uh, and, for instance, Crofts uh, Center as well. So as an example, it has been mentioned, and, and I'll do it just briefly just to highlight how some of these things come together. And uh, Dr. Levy will be talking about this in more detail uh, in, in the next session. Uh, we can briefly summarize the modeling we did for uh, castor uh, menthol modeling. Um, and uh, and uh, that really was a, a, a very nice project that sort of, uh, I guess, built, built on the previous work done by Drs. Uh, Levy, Mendes, and others. Uh, in integrating in a single analysis framework, uh, the epidemiology, uh, the, the policy aspects, and then the modeling development of uh, menthol cigarette and non-menthol cigarette use. And in order to sort of uh, bring all that information together and put them into uh, modeling frameworks that could be used to project the past or previous impact of menthol in the US and the impact of a potential uh, menthol ban in cigarettes in the US. And to highlight that as part of this process, really a lot of this information uh, that was presented before was being summarized, integrated in reviews, also our own analysis of PAD data, NHDUS, NHIS, and other surveys. And uh, also, of course, the effects or the modeling or the analysis, sorry, also to come up with uh, what are the, the policy impacts? Are, are people actually going to quit? What are they going to switch to? And so as part of that, doing systematic reviews of what was available, as well as conducting independent expert elicitations. So uh, based on expert assessment, we would have bounds of what the potential policy effects would be on the rates of initiation and cessation. So all that was put together in a model that uh, uh, Dr. Levy will describe later, but that in, uh, just very quickly uh, breaks the population into, into those who smoke menthol or, or non-menthol cigarettes, of course, those who don't use, and those who also use uh, vaping uh, here, here sort of uh, just focusing on exclusive vapors, uh, considering that uh, dual use probably is dominated by the health effects of cigarette smoking. So it's a simplification this model doesn't incorporate dual use, but nonetheless, it does capture the effects of E6 <clears throat> as alternatives to, to uh, menthol and uh, non-menthol cigarette smoking, and then, of course, former users of either product. And so this model was used, was put together with the best information we could uh, come up with in order to make projections of what the impact of that policy would be. And as shown yesterday by, <clears throat> by Dr. King and, and, uh, and others, um, the projections, uh, uh, and that we'll be describing more detail in, in the next session, <clears throat> um, uh, can be summarized uh, in this nice, uh, for instance, uh, infograph put together by the FDA where uh, it says that up to 650,000 deaths could be prevented uh, if menthol cigarettes uh, would be banned, uh, leading to a 15% reduction in smoking in five years. So these are the, pop, the, the projections of the model, which of course had a lot of additional uh, detail behind, but this is sort of the summary, like the punchline, right? And, and, and those analyses certainly contributed to the uh, proposed ruling and, and hopefully to the final ruling that we all expect to see soon. Um, we, I highlighted that we had multiple components of the mental modeling project, and here are some of the papers that uh, Dr. Bilente mentioned, two of these, of the burden or the harm of mental uh, retrospective in the U.S., the modeling of the, of the impact of a ban for the whole population and for non-Hispanic Black uh, population in the U.S., but of course, all the intermediate products that needed to be produced to uh, inform that modeling. And so in a sense, it was a very nice project, uh, really bringing all the interdisciplinary uh, team of Castor and others together and, and trying to summarize, of course, the evidence produced by, by uh, many others uh, for many years. So that is cigarettes, uh, menthol cigarettes, banning menthol cigarettes. So <clears throat> that seems to be 
uh, in a sense, uh, well uh, done, and there is enough data to do, and, and there's models <clears throat> that have done that. But that brings the question, well, what about other flavor restrictions? What about flavor e-cigarette restrictions? <clears throat> are there models out there already projecting what the impacts of those are going to be? <clears throat> and the answer is that not much. What about flavored cigars uh, 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 or models to project the impact of, of banning uh, flavored cigars? <clears throat> and the answer is that there isn't much. So we'll hear of the only published study, I think, that, that is out there of, of an, uh, an attempt to project what the impact would be by uh, Dr. Rostron. Uh, and you'll hear from Dr. John talking about the modeling that we're trying to do in Castor. But there isn't really much out there, and, and we'll highlight through this day why. <clears throat> and of course, part of the issue is the lack of information or good data. Uh, what about the impact of uh, uh, tobacco flavor restrictions that cover all flavor products or more than one type of product? So certainly that's that's a gap. And uh, any other possible combination of, of restrictions. And as we're thinking about that, of course, those become some of the potential policy or regulatory levels that could or might be considered as we're looking at the potential impact of these uh, regulations, like which products are included in enforcement um, and or the level of those restrictions. So I, I'll conclude uh, summarizing some of the, the challenges and opportunities, uh, thinking about the different pieces of information that are needed to model the impact of restrictions. Um, I'll, I'll uh, focus on a few topics. Uh, first, of course, is the use patterns. Um, challenges is, for instance, that, of course, there's a lot of data for menthol cigarettes, but there's more limited data for other products in terms of long-term data that would allow us to capture trends. Um, there's few national, national surveys that collect good data and flavors. Um, that's changing, but of course, it, it wasn't the case before. Uh, the flavor product landscape is so dynamic. There's new products emerging. Some of those were shown that as, as, as tobacco companies see some of these restrictions emerging, they change how they market the products, how they package their products. So new flavors are emerging every day. Uh, if we want to focus on subpopulations or subgroups, then we get to issues of sample sizes. And of course, also of complexity in models that if we want to look at, for instance, flavor cross subproduct combinations, for instance, non-premium flavor cigars, so <clears throat> the complexity of models will increase and the amount of data uh, is more limited, so it becomes challenging. But of course, this brings new opportunities. Uh, we need more data than the one was shown today. And uh, we need more information to really characterize what are the histories of use of, of, of users as they transition between flavor and flavor products and across different types of products. Uh, for instance, do individuals, as so I like to say, progress from the use of flavor to unflavor cigars? Uh, Transitions across products is one big uh, gap area. Um, so I'll just show you a, a couple of figures just to highlight what type of data I'm, I'm thinking about. And of course, <clears throat> we saw some good data on um, that uh, certainly there are, there are uh, patterns of where users of different uh, type of products might end up. So this is showing data from PATH, <clears throat> wave three, just consists of some of the state data that was shown earlier. Uh, here, users broken, uh, users of e-cigarettes and, uh, and cigarettes broken by flavor uh, grouping, uh, cigarettes by menthol and non-menthol, and ends by flavor versus unflavor, and unflavor includes tobacco flavor. And for instance, this type of things, what this shows is that really the, the, the user trajectories are very dynamic. And that if we start with 100% uh, dual users of ENTS flavor and cigarette non-menthol uh, users in wave three, by wave five, they've really moved out into many other compartments, right? So yeah, some remain in that category, but some drop all tobacco products. Some went exclusive into cigarettes. And you see that here, a predominance of non-menthol smoking. Uh, but some went to exclusive uh, ends, and you see that here, the, the, the proportion is much larger between ends flavor versus unflavored. Uh -huh. So if we contrast that now, rather than starting with those who were dual ends flavor and cigarette non-menthol, now look at dual ends flavor and cigarette menthol, and you see that the same, it's very dynamic, uh, people end in either no use or uh, dual use or exclusive use of either product. But interestingly here, you will see that those of this grouping who dropped cigarettes and became dual 
<clears throat> sorry, exclusive ends, ends users, there's almost none, it's not even shown there, that uh, end up in an unflavored exclusive ends. It's really the exclusive ends flavor where uh, <clears throat> those folks who drop the cigarettes end up. Of course, many of them end up in exclusive cigarette menthol. So understanding these trajectories is going to be critical to understand what are the potential <clears throat> uh, uh, changes that these folks are going to do once, for instance, menthol cigarettes are, are banned. <clears throat> And I'll just show, I'll show one more, just because I think it's interesting. This is for cigars, and <clears throat> we tend to to or we ignore cigars for many years. Uh, from my my, I mean that's my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of research happening in cigars, but I think it, it's <clears throat> it's it's not highlighted as a regulatory priority issue. Um, so in this case, for instance, you see transitions of those who in wave three were exclusive uh, flavor cigar users. And you can see that for those, uh, many of them end up not using anything uh, by way five. Uh, many of them continue using exclusive flavor cigars, but you see that some emerge that now are using uh, on flavor cigars and, and a small number, but uh, of course not negligible, are actually, uh, or end up uh, picking up cigarettes as well. So knowing and understanding these, these trajectories is critical for the <coughs> developing reliable models. Uh, challenges that we face is the lack of data on transitions between alternative products by flavor, but it's good to see that that data is emerging and it was showing the first two presentations. Uh, small sample sizes when looking at dual users, that's a big challenge. We, we unfortunately uh, don't have enough dual users in some of these surveys to really know what ends up happening with them. Uh, and of course, the the fact that there are important variations by sociodemographic groups uh, make it hard for us to be able to understand transitions uh, at a more granular level. Uh, but certainly that brings opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities to further conduct studies to, to understand longitudinal patterns of tobacco use and transition patterns across products and alternative preferences, which will be critical to, as I think was highlighted earlier, to maximize the public health impacts of flavor restrictions. We need to know what are people going to do in order to maximize those benefits. Two minutes. Yeah, to uh, a couple more points, flavor restriction effects. Of course, that is a big challenge, given that uh, there is limited information on flavor restrictions. Those are relatively new, other than than uh, for flavor cigarettes in the U.S. Of course, there's data from other countries, but the, the information is limited. Uh, there's potentially differential impacts by the type of restrictions and which products are included. Uh, we don't have good data right now on differential impacts by sociodemographic group. And it's challenging to really look at empirical data and try to tease the impact of some restrictions when many other things are happening, right? So, so how do these interact or, or synergistically, perhaps, uh, with other policies? What are the effects of local versus state restrictions? And how do those affect the impact, let's say, of a federal ban? And, and also other events, for instance, COVID or Valley, that certainly changed the patterns of use. Uh, and as was highlighted by Dr. Valenti, the, the industry responses, right? We don't live in a vacuum and whatever is done by public health, there's going to be a response by industry. Uh, so this brings a lot of opportunities. Uh, of course, there's many data sources that we need to rely on empirical studies. So we need more studies, epidemiologic, econometric, of the impact of flavor restrictions on use and sales, but also hypothetical studies like the ones we're going to hear about uh, from Dr. Young, as well as expert elicitations and other type of consultations of experts, as well as of users. So a lot of opportunities there and a lot of needs. So encourage everyone conducting those studies to get those done and get data out there so, so we modelers can, can use them and take them to, to inform our modeling. And the last piece of information that I'll just briefly mention is, of course, computational models. We need models, but <clears throat> when we talk about flavors and we talk about, let's say, two products, then the number of compartments and states get larger. Uh, so the complexity of those models gets gets larger and the data needs. So, so these are like data-hungry type of questions. Um, we need uh, more models. There's lots of cigarette smoking models. There's uh, models that include these cigarettes emerging, but not much for other products. And I think for the U.S. and for other places, the lack of cigar models is certainly a big gap. 
but again, that brings new opportunities. We can uh, bring new approaches. Uh, we're going to hear about agent-based models today, microsimulation, machine learning. So uh, this complexity, I think, makes things more interesting for uh, the modelers and in, uh, people from quantitative sciences that might get attracted to trying to answer some of those questions. So that certainly brings opportunities. So just to summarize, and I think uh, this is this is a very exciting and important issue and, and looking forward to the rest of the session. And sort of we've covered uh, a little bit of the background and the volume background. And so in the next uh, few talks, we're going to be hearing from modelers about obtaining information for policy effects, modeling the impacts uh, <coughs> retrospective of flavors, and modeling the impact of bans and restrictions. So uh, stay tuned with us, and, and we'll look forward to the the rest of the discussion. So I'll stop there and of course acknowledge the organizers and everyone from attending and, and our funding.